Chapter 20 Akabaka Sodi Cracker, Akabaka Boo, Akabaka Soda Cracker, I'm in love with you. The sounds of tag beat through the trees while the top branches waved in contrapuntal rhythms. I lay on a moment of green grass and telescoped the children's game to my vision. The girls ran about wild. Now here, now there, never here, never was. They seemed to have no more direction than a splattered egg, but it was a shared if seldom voiced knowledge that all movements fitted and worked according to a larger plan. I raised a platform for my mind's eye and marveled down on the outcome of Akabaka. The gay picnic dresses dashed, stopped, and darted like beautiful dragonflies over a dark pool. The boys, black whips in the sunlight, popped behind the trees where their girls had fled, half hidden and throbbing in the shadows. The summer picnic fish fry in the clearing by the pond was the biggest outdoor event of the year. Everyone was there. All churches were represented as well as the social groups, Elks, Eastern Star, Masons, Knights of Columbus, Daughters of Pythias, professional people, Negro teachers from Lafayette County, and all the excited children. Musicians brought cigar box, guitars, harmonicas, juice harps, combs wrapped in tissue paper, and even bathtub bases. The amount and variety of food would have found approval on the menu of a Roman epicure. Pans of fried chicken covered with dish towels sat under benches next to a mountain of potato salad crammed with hard-boiled eggs. Whole rust-red sticks of bologna were clothed in cheesecloth. Homemade pickles and chow-chow and baked count country hams aromatic with cloves and pineapples vied for prominence. Our steady customers had ordered cold watermelons, so Bailey and I chugged the striped green fruit into the Coca-Cola box and filled all the tubs with ice as well as the big black wash pot that Mama used to boil her laundry. Now they too lay sweating on the happy afternoon air. The summer picnic gave ladies a chance to show off their baking hands. On the barbecue pit, chickens and spare ribs sputtered in their own fat and a sauce whose recipe was guarded in the family like a scandalous affair. However, in the ecumenical light of the summer picnic, every true baking artist could reveal her prize to the delight and criticism of the town. Orange sponge cakes and dark brown mounds dripping Hershey's chocolate stood layer to layer with ice white coconuts and light brown caramels. Pound cakes sagged with their buttery weight and small children could no more resist licking the icings then their mothers could avoid slapping the sticky fingers. Proven fishermen and weekend amateurs sat on the, tru on the trunks of trees at the pond. They pulled the struggling bass and the silver perch from the swift water. A rotating crew of young girls scaled and cleaned the catch and busy women in starched aprons salted and rolled the fish in cornmeal then drop them in Dutch ovens trembling with boiling fat. On one corner of the clearing, a gospel group was rehearsing. Their harmony, packed as tight as sardines, floated over the music of the country singers and melted into the songs of the small children's ring games. Boys, don't you let that ball fall on none of my cakes. You do, and I'll be on you. Yes, ma'am and nothing changed. The boys continued hitting the tennis balls with palings snatched from a fence and running holes in the ground colliding with everyone. I had wanted to bring something to read, but Mama said if I didn't want to play with the other children, I could make myself useful by cleaning fish or bringing water from the nearest well or wood for the barbecue. I wandered into a retreat by accident. Signs with arrows around the barbecue pit pointed men, women, children toward fading lines, grown over since last year. Feeling ages old and very wise at 10, I couldn't allow myself to be found by small children squatting behind a tree. Neither did I have the nerve to follow the arrow pointing the way for women. 
If any grown-up had caught me there, it was possible she'd think I was being womanish and would report me to Mama, and I knew what I could expect from her. So when the urge hit me to relieve myself, I headed toward another direction. Once through the wall of sycamore trees, I found myself in a clearing ten times smaller than the picnic area and cool and quiet. After my business was taken care of, I found a seat between two protruding roots of black walnut tree and leaned back on its trunk. Heaven would be like that for the deserving. Maybe California too, looking straight up at the uneven circle of sky. I began to sense that I might be falling into a blue cloud far away. The children's voices and the thick odor of food cooking over open fire were the hooks I grabbed just in time to save myself. Grass squeaked and I jumped at being found. Louise Kendricks walked into my grove. I didn't know that she too was escaping the gay spirit. We were the same age and she and her mother lived in a neat little bungalow behind the school. Her cousins, who were in our age group, were wealthier and fairer, but I had secretly believed Louise to be the prettiest female in stamps next to Mrs. Flowers. What you doing sitting here by yourself, Marguerite? She didn't accuse. She asked for information. I said that I was watching the sky. She asked, what for? There was obviously no answer to a question like that, so I didn't make up one. Louise reminded me of Jane Eyre. Her mother lived in reduced circumstances, but she was genteel, and though she worked as a maid, I decided she should be called a governess, and so to Bailey and myself. Who could teach a romantic, dreamy ten-year-old to call a spade a spade? Mrs. Kendricks could not have been very old, but to me... All people over 18 were adults, and there could be no degree given or taken. They had to be catered to and pampered with politeness. Then they had to stay in the same category of look-alike, sound-alike, and being-alike. Louise was a lonely girl. Although she had plenty of playmates, she was a ready partner for any ring game in the schoolyard. Her face, which was long and dark chocolate brown, had a thin sheet of sadness over it, as light but as permanent as viewing gauze on a coffin, and her eyes, which I thought her best feature, shifted quickly as if what they sought had just a second before eluded her. She had come near, and the spotted light through the trees fell on her face and the braids in running splotches. I had never noticed before, but she looked exactly like Bailey. Her hair was good, more straight than kinky, and her features had the regularity of objects placed by a careful hand. She looked up. Well, you can't see much sky from here. Then she sat down an arm away from me, finding two exposed roots. She laid thin wrists on them as if she had been in an easy chair. Slowly, she leaned back against the tree. I closed my eyes and thought of the necessity of finding another place and the unlikelihood of there being another with all the qualifications that this one had. There was a little peal of a scream, and before I could open my eyes, Louise had grabbed my hand. I was falling, she shook her long braids. I was falling in the sky. I liked her for being able to fall in the sky and admit it. I suggested, let's try together. But we have to sit up straight on the account of five, Louise asked. Want to hold hands? Just in case. I did. If one of us did happen to fall, the other could pull her out. After a few near tumbles into eternity, both of us knew what it was. We laughed at having played with death and destruction and escaped. Louise said, let's look at that old sky while we're spinning. We took each other's hands in the center of the clearing and began turning around. Very slowly at first, we raised our chins and looked straight at the seductive patch of blue. Faster, just a little faster, then faster, faster yet. Yes, help, we were falling. Then eternity won after all. We couldn't stop spinning or falling until I was jerked out of her grasp by speedy 
by greedy gravity and thrown to my fate below. No, above, not below. I found myself safe and dizzy at the foot of the sycamore tree. Louise had ended on her knees at the other side of the grove. This was surely the time to laugh. We lost, but we hadn't lost anything. First we were giggling and crawling drunkenly toward each other, and then we were laughing out loud uproariously. We slapped each other on the back and shoulders and laughed some more. We had made a fool or a liar out of something, and didn't that just beat all? In daring to challenge the unknown with me, she became my best friend. We spent tedious hours teaching ourselves the Tut language. You yak o you no, kak nug o wug, what, whack, hashatut? Since all the other children spoke pig Latin, we were superior because tut was hard to speak and even harder to understand. At last I began to comprehend what girls giggled about. Louise would rattle off a few sentences to me in the unintelligible tut language and would laugh. Naturally, I laughed too, snickered really, understanding nothing. I don't think she understood half of what she was saying herself, but after all, girls have to giggle, and after being a woman for three years, I was about to become a girl. In school one day, a girl whom I barely knew had scarcely spoken to brought me a note. The intricate fold indicated that it was a love note. I was sure she had the wrong person, but she insisted. Picking the paper loose, I confessed to myself that I was frightened. Suppose it was somebody being funny. Suppose the paper would show a hideous beast and the word you written over it. Children did that sometimes. Just because they chimed, they claimed I was stuck up. Fortunately, I had got permission to go to the toilet, an outside job and in the, wreck, in the reeking gloom I read.